The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Afwa Hirsch on her new television series, Africa Rising, the Liverpool Biennial, and Jean-Michel Basquiat's Valentine in Basel. As a new series of journeys into the cultural scene across Africa take Afwa Hirsch to Morocco, Nigeria and South Africa, I talked to her about the artists and art scenes she encountered and what she took away from her experiences. The Liverpool Biennial's latest edition opened last weekend and has a South African curator, Kanyasili Mbongwa, and an Isizulu title, Umoya. Louisa Buck visited the Biennial and reviews it for us. And it's Art Basel this week in its original Swiss location. So this episode's work of the week is one of the most notable works for sale at the fair, Valentine, painted by Jean-Michel Basquiat in 1984 and given to his then-girlfriend Paige Powell on Valentine's Day. Geoffrey Deitch, who's selling the work, tells us its story. A reminder that you can subscribe to the art newspaper by visiting our website and clicking the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. You can choose from a digital, complete or student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With. And do leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, this week, the writer and broadcaster Afwa Hirsch resumed her televisual exploration of the cultural scenes in different African countries for the BBC. Her first series, called African Renaissance, took her to Ethiopia, Senegal and Kenya. In the new series, Africa Rising, she visits Morocco, Nigeria and South Africa and meets key visual arts figures in those countries. I spoke to Afwa about the series and the extraordinarily diverse cultures and places she witnessed. Afwa, in the sort of introduction to your program, you talk about it being a program about an Africa we don't usually see. Could you explain a bit more about that? Sure. For a few historic and actually quite complex social reasons, I think there is a very specific picture that's been painted of the African continent in the British and generally European and Western media. And I say that really from personal experience because I am of African heritage. My mother comes from Ghana, but I grew up in the UK and I also suffered from those really negative perceptions because my relationship with the African continent was also filtered through that media lens. So I think anyone who hadn't been to the continent would think that it was a place of really unremitting catastrophe. And I think there are a few reasons for that. One is is the historic relationship of colonisation and enslavement. And even when we kind of are honest about that history, it tends to be very negative. It's this history of suffering and exploitation. And so what's obscured by that is really fact that the African continent has been the home of unimaginable creativity for generations, for millennia. So much of global culture is still shaped by new generations of African artists, you know, the young artists who are creating Afrobeats, incredible paintings, sculpture, fashion. And I really wanted with the series to take a very honest look at that, to understand just what life is like creating in African countries and how artists draw inspiration and motivation and purpose from the social and historical and political and cultural context that they live in. So that was really the idea to just witness what's happening and really try to understand artists, their process, what makes them tick, their dreams, their frustrations, how things are changing around them. And, you know, in a way, that's quite a simple idea. But because it hasn't been done before, it felt quite radical. Indeed. And the first series was called Africa Renaissance. Yeah. This is called Africa Rising. Is that just nomenclature? or Is it about African Renaissance being located when there's a certain kind of work that was made at a certain time and you wanted to project it as a kind of much broader context? Yeah, I think it reflects the scale of the art we were witnessing and also the ambition of the programme itself. And the first series was really showing audiences that there is this cultural renaissance happening on the African continent. 
I think by the second season and because the first series did so well and also because things are escalating, I think in African countries now we are starting to become familiar with the fact that, for example, Nigeria is now a giant on the fine art scene. Morocco is becoming known for photography and contemporary culture. You know, South Africa is no longer just about apartheid. There are so many musicians, designers, sculptors coming out of South Africa. So I think we also became more ambitious with telling that story and seeing clearly that actually, I mean, mean, Renaissance is already a big concept, but this is a global rise, you know, and it's kind of unstoppable and it's also undeniable. So I think the name does reflect that. Absolutely. Tell me about the choice of countries to focus on, because that must have been so difficult. It's so difficult. I've had a lot of heat from Ghanaians because I, I was going to say Ghanaian <laughs> heritage. Why are you ignoring us? I'm actually really stressed about doing Ghana because I know it so well. And as that, there was actually a real pleasure for me in visiting countries that I don't know as well and being able to just be so curious and ask like sometimes basic questions and just kind of experience it as I found it. I think the more you know a place, the harder it is to have that very fresh lens. Also, I'm just going to get in trouble for everyone I don't include in a programme about Ghana. And I am a journalist, and this is a work of journalism, you know. It's not just kind of showing off or making people happy. It really is seeing what is happening and being able to be objective about it and rigorous about it. So, yeah, so that's quite stressful. It's hard to choose countries. We've tried to really reflect the diversity of the continent. It is one of the most diverse continents on Earth. You know, within Nigeria, there's more than a thousand languages spoken. That's just one country. So we tried to reflect North, East, Southern and West Africa and that really just is a nod to the fact that this is such a vast continent, such incredibly different histories, terrains, cultures. And so at the moment, you know, we're just trying to be fair to that big regional spread. But I hope this is a, a series that can keep running. And the more it does, the more countries we can cover. You hinted at it there when you talked about the languages in Nigeria. But it's really interesting that Ayobami Adebayo, when you're talking to her in the Nigeria episode, yeah. she talks about it being a nation of many nations. Yeah. She talks about how she's trying to discover the nation through her art. And of course, there's no obligation on you to just tell the full story here. In a way, it's always going to be the tip of the iceberg, but you have to explore the different facets of, of that sort of extraordinary network of culture, right? I think that's actually very liberating for me as a storyteller. I mean, it's both very simple and very difficult. It's simple because Africa has been so underrepresented that if you just show up with curiosity and show what's actually happening, it feels really fresh and original. So I think in a way we get unfair credit for doing something that's quite basic, just going and actually witnessing and and creating like a well-crafted story about something that's just simply there. On the other hand, it's very difficult because there is so much art. There are so many countries. There is so much diversity that it's it's really important for me that people don't interpret this as any claim for a definitive story about any country or even any art scene within the country. I definitely can't do that. I don't think any one person can do that. We are just asking people to experience a story that we found in each of these countries. And and I hope it will inspire other storytellers to go and look at other stories and other artists and places and phenomena that we we haven't seen because it, it really is so big. So I hope people do interpret it as the tip of the iceberg. That really piques their curiosity to dig deeper. It must have been really intriguing for you to kind of achieve the right tone in terms of how you approach it. Because on the one hand, this is clearly a celebration. You are engaging enthusiastically, exuberantly with the culture in so many of these programmes. But also, you don't shy away from difficult issues and from the difficult issues that are in the artist's work. Could you say something about that and about achieving that balance, if you like? So you can't ignore the troubles that exist within African countries, but you also don't want it to be limited by those troubles. It's quite complicated for me as a journalist. It's actually not my comfort zone to be in such a joyful space, actually. You know, usually we're telling people bad news and witnessing things that are a little bit more depressing. And I love art. I have so much 
energy and passion for art that I really couldn't hide. And I, I think it comes across when you watch it. I couldn't hide how energized and excited I was by the art that I encountered. So I was so fascinated and intrigued by the artists I met. And I think it's important to just be honest about that. I'm not going to pretend because I'm a journalist that I'm neutral about art. I love art and I have a huge passion for it. On the other hand, it is really important for me to be honest. And the reality is that African countries still encounter so many challenges. Just traveling for a few weeks and filming can be really challenging, let alone living, creating, trying to create global networks for your art. You know, when we ask Nigerians what makes them tick, what drives their creativity, to a fault, every artist said the hardship of living in Nigeria. The fact that just getting through a day is so difficult and really pushes you to your limits that whatever you create, you feel like there's no point in doing anything but everything. You go all out. You live every day like it could be your last. And I think that reflects in the excellence that Nigeria produces. So in a way, if they weren't separate stories. On the one hand, here's the beautiful art. And on the other hand, here's the social political reality. They felt very naturally all part of the same story. And it was really important for me to be honest about that and to do justice to the artists' experiences. But also, not all the artists come from really difficult or impoverished backgrounds. You know, we interviewed artists who have had very middle class lives or have been trained in the most prestigious art schools in the world, but who've been very intentional about going back to their country and being part of the creative scene there. And so again, it's just those diversity of stories. And because we have had such a simplistic view of Africa, we've really not been able to experience the complexity of the class and ethnic cultural dynamics within countries, within art scenes. And I think that's fascinating. So I also wanted to just let artists tell us what that reality is for them. And I was I was really conscious when I was watching the Nigerian episode about being summed up almost in a single day. I mean, I don't know how long you were with Georgia Sodi, but but basically yeah. in that day, you're going down the Nigerian Delta, you know, this extraordinary landscape, which is both beautiful and yet informed by the oil industry. And also you're present for his photographing a king. Yes. So and there's this sort of a kind of glamour, but also a kind of strangeness to that to mm. that scene. Mm. And, and I sort of sense that you you very much felt that strange kind of tension in that moment. It was very intense and it's all the things at once. And I think that filming in the Niger Delta just is a perfect metaphor for that incredible natural beauty. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Just the water and the greenery and the foliage and the landscape was stunning. It's also so polluted and so destroyed by heavy industry, especially oil. And that's quite heartbreaking to see. And, you know, those things coexist. And then you've just got real poverty, which is hard to make sense of in the midst of all this oil wealth that's creating billionaires all over the world. And then you also have royalty, you know, ancient royalty elites that go back generations that are also an integral part of the culture and part of people's everyday lives and identities. So those things are all juxtaposed and you kind of experience them all at the same time. So it is quite an intense immersion. And um, I think in some ways that's a metaphor for Nigeria. It's kind of everything is extra, all the good, all the bad, all of the extremes. I wanted to ask you about the interesting points that were made about European culture in relation to African culture in the episodes, because there's this really interesting point that Hassan Hajaj makes where he's saying a few years ago, artists from Morocco would have sought approval from European cities or European countries. And then there's also Yinka Shonabari talking about how art isn't just about showing in posh galleries, it's about community. And it seems to me that both of those points are absolutely crucial to understanding why Africa is so dynamic. If I were to pinpoint the one thing that I found has changed in my experience in recent years, it is that it's that I think some of the most successful creatives on the African continent are no longer centering international audiences or a Western gaze. That doesn't mean they're not selling to those markets or they're not being celebrated internationally. In fact, they are more than ever. And I think actually that's not a coincidence. I think they have kind of given themselves permission to be interested in their cultures and their communities. And that actually has made their work maybe more authentic, more bold, more interesting to everyone. I think the more courage you have in your authenticity, the more it's actually accessible to everyone. And I've really found that just whether you look at people who are actually physically returning to their countries, like Yinka Shonobare has spent his adult career in the UK and internationally, 
really spending a lot of time in Lagos. He's built this incredible space. He hosts artists. He's creating opportunities for local artists who don't have resources to really access their full potential. And that we saw everywhere. And I, I think that does say something about the promise and the hope that people feel for the art scene in their countries and their countries as a whole, that actually there are viable markets for art within the African continent. Now, you're not only selling to foreigners. You know, Nigerians want to buy Nigerian art and some of them have a lot of money, you know, and it's the same everywhere we went. So it's partly that I think the, the rise of the middle class and, you know, these economies in some cases really thriving. On the other hand, I think it is also more of a philosophical change of identity that artists are having more clarity about what it means to be African, what it means to be Black, what it means to be Nigerian, what it means to be Yoruba, you know, going specifically into their identities. And I'm really interested in that. I, I find identity fascinating. And and similarly in Morocco, like you were saying about Hassan Hajjaj, you know, hugely celebrated internationally, but you will find him in the Medina, in Marrakesh, talking to the people from the Medina, telling stories about Morocco. It's almost like having achieved all that international acclaim, he's now becoming more and more kind of meta about who he is and, the, and what Morocco is and what the Moroccan story is. Um, and I think it reflects a kind of almost geopolitical shift that Africa is now. It's not asking to be seen. It's not asking to be taken seriously. It's dictating its own terms because it's starting to really feel the leverage that it has as a cultural powerhouse. And I think it's also just these changes that we're all experiencing. You know, social media has really changed the landscape. The, the old gatekeepers are no longer able to have a monopoly over who becomes globally renowned, who becomes successful. And lots of young artists are incredibly savvy about taking advantage of that. And that was really interesting to see. I mean, we went to a village in southern Nigeria where a family of children are achieving global fame by making basically spoofs of Hollywood trailers in their yard with scrap materials. And it's just, it could never have happened before. It could never have happened before. They're a sensation. And that's a really joyous moment yeah. isn't it, in the film. I love that bit. I really loved it as well. I'm also struck by the bravery that you discover in Zainab Fasiki, who is this graphic novel artist who uses social media to get her messages out there and has perceived a shift in the sort of appreciation of her work due to the, its sort of body positive messages, due to its its frank nudity and so on in the culture around her? I thought Zainab was incredibly brave because the reality is that it is still a criminal offence to have sex outside of marriage in Morocco. So much as it is this huge cultural powerhouse, it's the most visited African country on the entire continent, it still has a very conservative value system which is reflected in quite harsh penal codes which is it's real you can be arrested for violating these mores and uh, she is really creating images that open conversations about sexuality about gender about bodies about sex and I think hers was a story of how much Morocco is changing because I, she herself said it would have been inconceivable for her to be able to do this work and have these conversations in Morocco 10, maybe even five years ago. And there has been some quite radical change, I think, in the appetite for modernising social conventions, rights. I think there's still a long way to go and her life is hard. I think she still kind of lives in fear to some extent for being persecuted for her work. But she also finds so many Moroccans, and this is what she was telling us, thanking her, so many parents thanking her. One of the things she creates through her graphic novels are stories that parents can use to educate their children about sex and sexuality, about consent and body positivity. And she said she's found so much demand for that. It's just, you couldn't see it because no one was talking about it. So I think she's incredibly brave and also just really interesting. Her work is so quirky. It's so arresting. Even if you don't have a child and you're not struggling with body positivity, you could still read any of her novels and just find them totally exhilarating. So she's an example, I think, of the, the courage we found in many of the artists, just because it's not always a friendly space to be working in. And they persevere because they feel it's their calling. And I think that's something that in a way everyone can relate to, just feeling like there is something that you are so put on this earth to do that you will keep doing it regardless of the circumstances. 
And then on the other hand, you have Yasmin Hatimi, who's exploring masculinity very poetically, actually, in a completely different language, if you like, but still with a similarly sort of huge impact. I learned a lot from Yasmin because I think one of the things I really admire about her is she's determined to have conversations with people she doesn't agree with. And, you know, I think we can all recognise that we're living in a time when that is a harder and harder thing to do. It feels like we are just increasingly more polarised. And she is a feminist. She's a, a, a woman with a lot of agency and autonomy, but she's interested in masculinity and she's interested in interrogating, encountering, just having a discourse with people who have different views about gender, power. And she has a really subtle approach. You know, her approach is to take photographs of men or fathers with their sons, men talking about love and emotion, which isn't something that I think is always very accessible in Morocco. So even just taking a photo of a man in the context of what love means and what tenderness means can just feel really surprising because it's not how masculinity tends to have been depicted in Morocco, or at least not how we've been able to see it from the outside. So it was also for me really interesting just to see the diversity of approaches that artists take to tackle these subjects. You know, some of the artists we met are incredibly radical and on the nose. Some were like very restrained and subtle. And I think there is space for every approach and every approach has merit and there was beauty in everything we saw. So that was really interesting. And I, I think I took from that that sometimes in a place that is tentative about change, sometimes those more gradual, gentle interventions can actually be so powerful. One of the ways in which the languages, the cultural forms are developing is actually through engaging directly with tradition, right, as well. There's this lovely engagement on the whole through the programmes with material culture in all sorts of ways. So it's the Adire fabric, the Amazigh weaving and so on that you engage with and also all sorts of dresses that you're wearing, whether it's in Hassan Hashaji's photographs or, you know, it's, it, there's a sense in which the materiality of African culture is really sort of front and centre in, in almost every scene of the whole programme. I hope you didn't get sick of seeing me try on clothes. That not was actually all, one no. of the, the most fun things for me. <laughs> I'm conscious that not everyone enjoys it as much as I do. I really relate to that phenomenon. I think you've articulated it so well. You know, I've written about this in a British context. I think that globalisation is making many of us more interested in our own heritage, in our own cultural identity, in our own story, whatever that identity is. And I really saw that with a kind of younger generation of artists on the African continent, that they're actually obsessed with their ancestral traditions, with the practices that were used before colonialism brought in more modern, industrialised techniques. So as you were saying about Adire, which is the traditional way of printing cloth with very natural indigo dyes in Nigeria... And of course, it's completely sustainable. It doesn't use any toxic chemicals. It's all natural ingredients. And you keep these pieces for life. You know, they're made painstakingly by hand. It was just so interesting to see young artists really embracing that craftsmanship, really wanting to revert to things that their ancestors did, but also to make it relevant to them and use those traditions to have questions about gender or sexuality or power that they're interested in. So I think that is something that is happening across the world. I think we all have this yearning to really understand the past and understand what we are the inheritors of. And I, I'm really interested in how that affects artists. It looks different in Morocco or South Africa or Nigeria, but it's the similar theme just manifesting so differently because the cultural traditions that people are are looking back to are so different. Okay, well, Afwa, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much, Ben. Africa Rising Morocco is on BBC iPlayer now. The Nigeria episode is on BBC Two on 20th of June at 9pm for UK viewers and on BBC iPlayer. And South Africa is broadcast on BBC Two on the 27th of June at 9pm. If you're outside the UK, check your local listings. Coming up, the Liverpool Biennial and Basquiat in Basel. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. 
Two environmental activists smeared red paint and then glued their hands to the glass on a Claude Monet painting in Stockholm on Wednesday. The artist's garden at Giverny is at Sweden's National Museum. A statement confirmed that the protesters made handprints with paint on the picture, which is on loan to the museum from the Musée d'Orsay in Paris for the exhibition The Garden, Six Centuries of Art and Nature, which we featured earlier this year on this podcast. A spokesman confirmed that the painting is unharmed and that the museum is now hoping to reinstall the work in dialogue with the Paris Museum. The last portrait painted by Gustav Klimt will carry the highest estimate ever put on a painting in Europe or the UK when it appears at Sotheby's in London this June. The sale, for at least £65 million, is effectively a foregone conclusion as it's guaranteed by a third party. Dharma mit Fescher, or Woman with a Fan, painted in 1917, was still on an easel in Klimt's studio when he died in February 1918. Sotheby's last sold the painting in 1994 for $11.6 million with fees. The street artist Banksy has announced a surprise exhibition at the Gallery of Modern Art in Glasgow. Cut and Run is an exhibition of stencils for his work made over 25 years. Banksy said on a website dedicated to the exhibition that he'd kept them hidden until now, mindful that they could be used as evidence in a charge of criminal damage. But he says that moment seems to have passed, so he's exhibiting them as works of art. The exhibition runs from the 18th of June until the 28th of August. You can read all these stories at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. And for those of you that missed the Vermeer blockbuster that we talked about on this podcast in February at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, the Art Newspapers published an insider's guide to seeing all of the artist's 36 authenticated paintings across the globe. The 37th was famously stolen from Boston's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in 1990. The piece takes you from London and New York to Braunschweig and Tokyo. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. From the 21st of June to the 5th of July, Christie's 20th 21st Century Art Auction Series celebrates masterworks spanning over 100 years of creativity and innovation, with four live and online sales in London. The evening sale spotlights the dynamism and diversity of portraiture through the generations, with a strong section of works of artists painted by other artists, including Jean-Michel Basquiat's portrait of Pablo Picasso, Picasso's image of Dora Maar, and Frank Auerbach's head of Leon Kossoff, as well as self-portraits by Lucien Freud, Howard Hodgkin and Edgar Duggar. This is accompanied by highlights exploring the theme of humanity's relationship with nature, featuring Paul Signac's pointless composition of Saint-Tropez. Conversations between Impressionist, Modern and Contemporary Art continue throughout the series, showcasing groundbreaking work by Pierre-Auguste Renoir, Marc Chagall and Vasily Kandinsky, alongside excellent examples by Barbara Kruger, Yoyo Kusama and Andy Warhol. Their pre-sale exhibition is open to the public starting from the 20th of June at 8 King Street in St James's in London with free entry. Discover all this and more at christies.com. Welcome back. Now, the Liverpool Biennial celebrates its 25th anniversary this year with its 12th edition. The artistic director for this incarnation is the South African artist Kanyusile Mbongwa, whose exhibition is entitled Umoya, The Sacred Return of Lost Things. Our contemporary art correspondent, Louisa Buck, went to Liverpool for the opening weekend and she joined me to review the show. Louisa, one of the curious things about biennials is even if they are staged in great art countries, they don't necessarily have to be world leading biennial so in other words you have got something like the Whitney biennial in New York but then the other biennials that are really super notable are for instance in Venice and in Kassel in Germany so where does Liverpool biennial fit in is it a really notable occasion has it sort of got into its stride over these past 25 years? I think it absolutely has and I think it's really renowned as an international biennial. We're going to be talking more about this, the status of Liverpool as a kind of international entrepot, but they've always really punched very hard, you know, to their weight. You've got Tate Liverpool there as the kind of matrix and that's always been at the centre of the biennial. It certainly helps when you've got some institutional infrastructure. Plus the art schools, it's an incredibly dynamic city and they've always managed to pick really good curators. I mean, you know, some better than others, but who can really pull in a large international gathering, but also to really embed it in the local scene. So I'd say it's one of the best biennales around. Tell us about the theme of this year's biennial. So this biennale is curated by the South African artist and curator Kwanisili Mobonga, and she has used this theme Umoya, the sacred return of lost things. Now, Umoya is an Isizulu word. It has multiple meanings, but it means spirit, soul, breath, wind. I mean, basically, it's dealing with the, the 
dirty, appalling history of Liverpool as the kind of, you know, on the crucibles of colonialism, the impact of slavery and colonialism, all of which emanated from Liverpool's port. Liverpool is, I think, the oldest wet dock in the UK, so it has this long history of commerce, cotton, tobacco, sugar, and she's really engaging with this, and she says the theme was the attempted return of that which has been lost and taken and from those that have been silenced and forgotten. So we're talking, you know, a big agenda here, a big sense of reparation. One of the things that I noticed is that the delayed biennial that was in 2021 also sort of touched on this theme, but this one seems to have really placed it absolutely at the centre of the biennial. Absolutely, yes. I mean, you've got 35 artists, six continents, you know, 25 countries. So it's not just British colonialism, actually. It's the whole kind of obviously interconnected web of appalling trade, commerce, human trafficking. And yes, it has been touched upon before. I mean, quite, you know, quite intermittently throughout the years with Liverpool because you can't not. But this one absolutely grapples with it. At the opening, Kanye Sili Mabonga actually performed a kind of Isi Zulu ritual because she's also a shaman as well. So you know, there was really much a sense of calling the ancestors making reparation, allowing people who have been silenced, forgotten, murdered to speak up. And so this is very much what she wanted to do, to say she wanted the people of Liverpool to be not an audience but a witness. I mean, it's a lot to grapple with. And I think I would like to have been more positive about all the work, but I think quite a lot of the work, to my mind, particularly in Tate Liverpool, was frankly a little bit too literal for me. I felt that it could have been a bit more embedded in the ritual that the artworks suggested. For example, a Guadeloupe Maravilla disease thrower who made these amazing um, structures, sort of sculptures, come costumes to chart his own migration passage from El Salvador to the US, a bodysuit. But we never saw the rituals. There wasn't even a monitor of the rituals on, so they were very inert. And then slightly reminded me of other artists like Nick Cave, who've also used costumes quite frequently. Another artist, Sandra Subi from Uganda, did her samba gown, which is an amazing gown in the middle of a, the, the gallery with, made from rubbish and detritus with stuff underneath the skirts and slogans about men and women and sexism written on them. Photographs of an amazing African woman in landfill, rubbish dumps, obviously performing an incredible performance in this gown, but we didn't see it. It was all a little bit inert. So in a way, what you're saying is that there's a lot of illustration here. A little bit so. I mean, I felt that activation was needed. I mean, the first thing you walk into in Tate, Liverpool, is Torquoise Dyson's uh, Liquid A Place with these large three hull-like minimal sculptures. But you really think of them as three big minimal sculptures more, and there's lots of label talk about the triangular apertures could refer to the triangular trade, they could be shelters, all these kind of reasons, but you don't really get that. They look like three large minimal sculptures. Now, when I first saw them in London at the Pace Gallery, or ones very like them, they were being activated by performance. So you have a sense, again, of you know, a sort of movement and a sense of, of enrichment taking place. And I think, for me, the most powerful entire part of the biennial was this amazing performance where you did get all this and this was in the vast tobacco warehouse which was I think it was the largest brick building in the world and might even still be the largest brick building in the world but I think it was the largest sort of single building in the world for a while it's enormous, humongous. And these incredible structures, you know, within the context of this biannual, suddenly become activated. So we had Albert Ibokwekosa from from South Africa, their performance, The Black Circus of the Republic of Bantu, which was very, the theme of it was this of human zoos and exhibitions. And you walked in and there was this you know, very statuesque, large figure with a hat with joysticks blazing away, just glaring at the audience. And then, I mean, it's a long performance, I won't go through it all, we'd hear all day, but took all the clothes off, stripped naked, went to each of us, gazed us, eyeballed us, and then became from being kind of furious and quietly angry, glaring, then started singing and dancing and made three members of the audience, some of whom had their hands bound, wear gorilla masks and dance to the cracking of a whip because it was about the sort of circus display of native peoples. And I mean, boy, was that tough. So inside the vast tobacco warehouse structure, you know, with all this history of the tobacco, the sugar, the cotton that had been stored there, this inversion and this anger, they'd also built a shrine and there were other kind of bits of props hanging around that were left when the performance was over. That was really tough. It activated the side. So in that sense, it was very evocative of exactly what Mbongwa said in terms of the audience's witnesses, that point that you made. In other words, 
if they're not going to be an audience, but they're going to be witnesses, they've got to be active and they've got to be activated by the art, if you like. That's absolutely right, Ben. And I think there has to be the sense of kind of exchange. There was a kind of a savage joy and fear in this performance. And then things like other installations inside the tobacco warehouse around, for example, Binta Diao, who'd made this remake of the famous Brook slave ship diagram of the terrifying people packed in like sardines, but almost life size. So it's this huge ship remade in Earth. So you walk in and you think it's some big garden, some big sort of, you know, minimal land art thing going on. Then you look and you see, and we all know that slave ship plan, Mm, you know, one of the few things that didn't make it through the early British education. But in the context of the performance that you then see unfolding, you then also see there's little shoots growing out of the garden of the slave ships. There's a sense of sort of reparation. There's a sense of smelling the soil, you know, and all these different connotations come through. So I think... Interestingly, things that slightly annoyed me, recalling Tate Liverpool the day before, when I'd been a bit angry about the lack of activism of the artefacts, somehow because of this performance, it elevated them for me and made me think, yes, OK, I can sort of engage with it and, as you say, be more of a witness. But it's tricky so often with these works because, for example, the Edgar Kallel, which is a piece which the Tate now doesn't own, it has custodianship, famously, of this piece, and it's a Mayan ritualistic piece where you have rocks and fruit but there's a very secret intense ritual that the custodian that the, the sort of temporary owner the Tate has it for 13 years because there's 13 joints in the body I think so it's very much embedded in my own ritual but you see these things lying on the floor of Tate Britain and it's you know 20 or 30 plus rocks with fruit balance on the top and it, it seems very inert again it seems quite literal so you need these performances you need the sense of engagement to kind of push you into a different dimension Right and I suppose what we're dealing with then is this curious balance which is a very very current art world problem if you like which is contemporary art languages which are from conceptualism which are from minimalism post-minimalism so on being re-employed to explicitly political or social commentary and I think the thing is that I guess that the the thing that the artist has to struggle with then is to what extent they do illustrate and to what extent they evoke and to what extent they let the object exist and manifest itself in its, on its own terms and work as art first and then as a message second. Well, right? exactly. And I think it becomes very problematic. I mean, another artist I'm thinking of is David Aguachero from Mozambique who had a boat full of oil drums and then large black and white photographs of figures sort of covered in oil, you know, in various states of obviously distress. It was... You know, and you think, oh, my God, how many times have I seen oil drums in contemporary art? And indeed, to make points about, you know, pollution, control, colonialism. And, of course, you, you, you hate yourself for it, particularly as a white, you know, middle-class woman. I'm kind of trying very hard not to go, oh, my God, there's an oil drum or another piece of raffia or another, you know, another kind of performative costume. As you say, you have to have some kind of sense of transcendence. I think my pieces did work well. As I said, the tobacco warehouse, these evocative sites or the sugar exchange and other Thing, where you have these kind of blighted buildings, these buildings that evoke so much. And I felt with Tate, Liverpool, it's on the dock side, as I said, the earliest wet dock, and I'd like more of a sense of actually engaging with the outside, the inside, maybe some work just to really make us remember that the stones under our feet are filthy stones, <laughs> you know, built from you know, desperate, horrible commerce. And I felt that where things popped up in the public spaces, that also helped a bit. I'm thinking particularly of a piece by Ranti Bam, in the Our Lady in St Nicholas Church. And these were column-like sculptures in clay, almost of life size, but it all kind of collapsed and buckled and they were very fleshy and they were on these kind of very traditional Yoruba stools rather than plinths and they were going to get seagulls mess on them and people staggering around. There was a sense of them very much integrating with their surroundings, very anti-monumental, this sort of crowd. And I thought that was interesting because also quite that area has sort of hubristic, you know, colonialist sculptures all over the place. And another one I liked too was Nicholas Gallanin in St John's Gardens had these masks which were baskets and related very much to African and also North American basket work. And they were cast in bronze on plinths, but they had eye holes and a nose hole cut out, like burglar masks, like burglars will wear ski masks and cut holes in them. So they were these kind of mask-like, obviously having a kind of ethnographic sort of vibe to them, but also a kind of burglar vibe, accusingly gazing in these very minimal but also quite arresting ways, again, in a kind of municipal square surrounded by grand colonial buildings. That, again, I think the fabric of the city gets activated. I think that speaks to what separates a good biennial from an exhibition, if you like, Mm. in the sense that 
when we think of some of the best biannual experiences we might have had, it normally is about the site and the work in parallel, right? So as you say, the tobacco factory, these loaded spaces, again, if we're talking about witnessing and activation and so on, the loadedness of, of the very bricks and mortar of these spaces brings an element of subject matter into the work even before the work itself does anything. Well, it is, it's that old cliche transcendence. You know, the artwork has to transcend its sort of the artist's intention, its meaning. It has to convey its meaning but also allow the viewer, the witness, the spectator, whatever you want to call yourself, some sort of room for manoeuvre and some room to be able to negotiate, bring our own subjectivity to it. And I think it is, you're absolutely right, the best biennales are where the site and the work sing. I mean, there was another one, another great performance, actually. Lauren Sukho, again from South Africa, did this extraordinary performance in St Luke's bombed-out church where you know she appeared naked but with sort of awful cuffs and collar and white socks and bar shoes, and it was all about the band to education allowing black children to come in and be educated to be in these really hardcore Christian schools and they were particularly discriminated against and particularly kind of brutalised and made to be absolutely doctrinaire Christians being good little children in buttoned up shirts and there was lots of, sort of smiling and dancing and playing of records of, of African voices singing kind of gospel songs and it was really chilling in a bombed out church so you know you could have all these kind of feelings about Christianity authority I thought it was extraordinary seeing white people being made to wear gorilla masks bound hands being made to dance one of whom was the director of Liverpool Biennial, by the way. You know, I'm not sure that um, Bo Kwekosla knew this, but anyway, seeing something very tough on the one hand is extraordinary, but also you need to have this sort of light and shade, I think, in a way. Absolutely. One of the things I'm conscious of hearing you talk about it is that I don't know the work of a lot of these artists. And it seems to me that there's a really interesting thing that Liverpool Biennial has done over the years is it's sort of toed and froed, if you like, between very well-known artists with the occasional new emerging artist or whatever, and then this kind of biennial where it really does introduce lots of artists to a wide public, at least a, a wide British public. Yeah, I mean, Lubaina Himid, we all know very well, had, had two lovely paintings there, redoing the Tissot figures on the on the deck of the ship with, with black figures on decks of ships, of course, been very rarely painted on decks of ships. But in a way, it was the new artists. There were other people, Melanie Mancho, who I know as well, did a whole piece about addiction and individuals in Liverpool overcoming addiction. But actually, it was the new voices, I mean, new to me at any rate, that I found the most exciting. It was really nice to have people coming to Liverpool and really reacting. I mean, there are about 25 or so new commissions. And I think, yeah, that's again what I love when you see artists grappling with surroundings and really kind of getting to grips with what it says to them and how it speaks to them and then by implication to us as well. One of the things that Okuyen Wazor, who was a great biennialist, you know, curated documenter, Venice and so on, said was that we kind of sample biennials as opposed to seeing them. We cannot wholly grasp an entire project because there is so much, much of it's time-based and so on. What did you feel about how wholly you experience this biennial and how wholly anybody can experience it when they visit? Actually, it was smaller, I think, than a lot of biennials. And it didn't have all the satellite stuff that was going on to such an extent, which I thought was an advantage. But... No, you can never experience the whole thing. But what it did do, and particularly I keep banging on about the performance, or indeed in some cases lack of performative elements, even if it was on a monitor, but nonetheless what it did do was really make me feel like there were voices from round the globe resonating back at Liverpool. I did feel that, and I think Kenya Sili Mwanga really pulled that off, and the voices did resonate, but it was in the live work. So quite how that's going to be when all those performances are finished and people wander around and see the kind of artefacts the detritus, sometimes some very evocative installations in the wake, but that I think will be tricky. But it certainly made the stones of Liverpool, which you know I knew were pretty blood soaked, but it made them kind of speak back from the voices that they had subjugated. Louisa, thank you so much. Thank you. The Liverpool Biennial Umoya, the sacred return of lost things, continues until the 17th of September. Finally, it's time for the work of the week. It's the Art Basel Fair this week in its original hometown of Basel in Switzerland. And while our reports show that collectors are being cautious amid a clear downturn in the market, there's no shortage of buzz about a work being presented at the fair by the US dealer Geoffrey Deitch. Valentine by Jean-Michel Basquiat was painted for the artist's then-girlfriend Paige Powell in 1984 and given to her on the 14th of February of that year. It's been in Powell's private collection until now. I caught up with Geoffrey Deitch to talk about the work and its emergence onto the market. 
Jeffrey, I wanted to go back to the start of your relationship with Basquiat because is it right as your then role as an art critic, you were the first critic to write about Basquiat's work. Of course, he was known as Samo then in 1980. That's right. So in my review of the Times Square show in Art in America in September 1980, I was actually the first art writer to write about Jean-Michel Basquiat using his real name. There had been some stories about Samo in the Village Voice prior to that. I still remember walking into what was the fashion room at the Times Square show, and the walls had been painted by Jean-Michel Basquiat, and I think I, I described it as a knockout combination of de Kooning and subway spray paint. I was stunned by it, and that started my interest in Jean-Michel. I have already, of course, been a follower of Samo. Did you know him at that point? Had you met him by the time you wrote about him? Well, I had seen him. Uh -huh. <laughs> seeing his band, Grey, at a performance on Canal Street in a club, and he was leaned over a beatbox, and somebody pointed him out to that Samo. Right. I hadn't yet actually had a conversation with him, but after seeing this phenomenal work at the Times Square show, Diego Cortez, who was a friend of his, brought me over to meet Jean-Michel at Suzanne Malouk's apartment, First Street and First Avenue in the Lower East Side. And it bears repeating, doesn't it, that he was astonishingly young at that stage. He, he was, what, 20 at that point? Yeah, if that, you know, 19 or 20. Of course, a genius-level person, self-educated, he had been to some good schools, like St. Anne's in Brooklyn, but finished at City S School. That's what he attended. And there's a famous story where he threw a cream pie in the principal's face at graduation. <laughs> and he never went back. Right. But he didn't need it. Because he had this ability to flip through an art book or an atlas or an anatomy text and absorb almost everything in it. He had a photographic memory. You know, people toss around that term. Jean-Michel actually did have a photographic memory. He could recall conversations that I had with him, just small talk conversations, three years later. Amazing mental capacity. And the painting that we're going to talk about was made, actually completed it by the sounds of it, on New Year's Day, 1984. At that stage... I think now of Basquiat being at the absolute height of his fame. Is that the right assumption? Yes. I, I, well, it, the height of his underground fame. Right. It hadn't yet expanded to the broader culture. So from the start with Samo, before people in the art community knew who it was, people already knew this was the work of genius. So the friends in the community didn't need any convincing that from the beginning, people recognized this was maybe the biggest talent of his generation. And Paige Powell is part of that scene, and she's a crucial figure in the story of this painting that we're going to talk about, right? So Paige is a remarkable person. She's a good friend of mine. So very American story. She comes from a pioneer family that traveled across the United States in covered wagons and settled Oregon five generations before. And so she had this brilliant and naive idea. She was going to move to New York and get a job either with Woody Allen or Andy Warhol. <laughs> and so she actually got a job with Woody Allen. She met some people connected with him, his producers, this very charming person who immediately everybody likes. And the issue with Woody Allen is the production wasn't going to start for several months. And then she goes to Andy Warhol's and Bob Coachello asks, well, can you sell ads? <laughs> and she connects with Andy Warhol, becomes an ad salesperson for interview. But most significantly, Andy loved her and Andy went out virtually every night and Paige became his companion going out everywhere with 
high society, with downtown artists, with musicians. And so this young woman from Portland, Oregon, who wasn't really experienced with the life of New York City, all of a sudden is at the very center, the epicenter. And through Jay Shriver, who worked in the factory, not Andy directly, Jay took her to meet Jean-Michel Basquiat. And that's how that relationship started. But it's a fascinating relationship with Paige, Andy, and Jean-Michel because it's a triangular relationship full of jealousies and it's fascinating. And so I knew about this painting for a long time. Jean-Michel worked on it first in 1983 and New Year's Eve, they came back to the studio in Crosby Street and he finished it and the red and gave it as a gift to Paige on Valentine's Day February 1984. So the painting is in a heart shape. It has a pink lavender background. But subject matter, that's the most interesting. Yeah, so it relates to Paige's former job in a zoo, right? So, you know, with animals. Paige Powell is famous for loving animals. So before she moved to New York, she volunteered in the Portland, Oregon Zoo. And her job was to help taking care of the chimpanzees and she would feed the chimpanzees and Jean-Michel loved Paige's stories about working with the chimpanzees and feeding them and one of the things they did together is very cute is like chimpanzees they fed each other and we have this wonderful photograph of Jean-Michel feeding Paige and it built just like the painting. So Jean-Michel was able to do that, of have an image in his mind and then put it right onto the canvas. What's extraordinary about this painting, of course, is that this isn't just a sort of A4 sized little trifle, is it? It's a vast picture, actually. It's a couple of meters, meter and a half high. Right. It's a very powerful painting. It's a self portrait, Jean-Michel and Paige Powell, as chimpanzees feeding each other in this beautiful embrace. So it gets quite a remarkable image and a great story. You've obviously mentioned this extraordinary triangle because of course it's a portrait of Paige and Jean-Michel, but Warhol's involvement is so crucial too, right? Because one, he took a photograph of it unfinished in Basquiat's studio. It was in the back of a photograph. And then, rather extraordinarily, Paige took a photograph of herself with Valentine as she embarked to go to Andy Warhol's funeral. So it seems that she connected that absolutely, not just to her and her partner at the time, but to her partner and his great artistic relationship. This is the record, not just of her relationship with Jean-Michel Basquiat, but with Andy Warhol. She must have been with Andy when Andy came to the Crosby Street studio and took that photograph. So Andy famously always had his camera and recorded the life of the New York art community and the expanded community that he was part of. It's just an extraordinary inside view. But Paige was with him and took up photography as well. And so also recorded many of these amazing encounters. So Paige has something like 30,000 negatives So for years, they were in cardboard boxes stashed under her bed in Portland in her rented house. And there's a great friend of Paige's, the musician Thomas Lauderdale, who leads the band Pink Martini. He's a a fixture of culture in Portland. And he took it upon himself and said, Paige, we need to archive these photographs. This is essential. This is cultural history. And so he helped Paige to a crew of archivists and so over the past decade they've been archiving all the works for photographic works printing them and another great mutual friend Kim Hostreiter who co-founded Paper Magazine is also a great friend of Pages produced this fantastic four volume book that was sponsored by Gucci 
of just a section of pages, photographs of the New York City scene. I wrote one of the introductory texts using the title of a famous early Andy Warhol work, Success is a Job in New York. <laughs> and uh, that's certainly yet applied to Page. Tell me more about Page deciding now to let it go, because of course it's nearly 40 years that she's had this. So this is a very important part of Paige's life. She kept it with her in New York City. After Andy died, she stayed on with Interview as a, an associate publisher. And you know, she was instrumental in some of the famous ad campaigns, like the Absolute Vodka campaigns with artists. But it became kind of sad for her in New York with a number of her friends dying of AIDS and the, without Andy, without Jean-Michel. She moved back to Portland to volunteer with animal rights organizations, and she still does that. And she took the painting with her and put it on loan to the Portland Art Museum. And they would hang it from time to time. Sometimes it would be in the storage. But that it was at the Portland Art Museum for years. So people in Portland knew it, but it was not well known. It, it was not published. It was a very personal work. So Paige, she doesn't own a house. She would like to buy a house for her retirement years. So that's why she's now decided to give me the painting to sell. And because it was not in the literature for the past couple of years, uh, it's been lent to exhibitions, the Bosca exhibition in Japan. It's been published. So now it has some history and we felt with the great Basquiat Modena exhibition here in Basel and the Warhol Basquiat collaboration show in Paris, we thought this is the time to present it. And uh, people are so fascinated. We, we have a very good offer on the painting, which we haven't accepted yet, but I expect it will be sold here at the fair. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Okay, thank you. Art Basel continues until the 18th of June. The exhibition of Basquiat's Modena paintings that Jeffrey mentioned is at the Biola Foundation in Basel until the 27th of August. <laughs> And that's it for this episode. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Julia Mahalska and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Afwa, Louisa and Jeffrey. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.